right, so on to our last river valley civilization and probably one of the most important of all, China. Let's go. Okay, so China's river valley obviously began in China. Wow. So China began along the Yellow or the Hongqi and Yangtze rivers in North China Plain. And only 10% of China at the time was suitable for farming. So, you know, unlike Mesopotamia, unlike the Indus River Valley, these are not going to be as great of lands for people to farm on. It's going to be more like the Egyptian lands when they tried to farm. So the Yellow River flooding was unpredictable and was called China's Sorrow because its floods often destroyed entire villages. So just like some of these other rivers and valley uh, civilizations, they would have these huge floods. And again, it's not like you go on the Weather Channel and see what the weather lady had to say. They would just guess and they would be completely unpredictable when they have these floods and it would destroy your entire home that you just created. So China was protected and isolated from outsiders by both deserts and the Himalayan mountains. So even though in all of these or these civilizations they didn't have armies, they didn't have that organization yet, they did have geographical things that would help protect them from outsiders. And so mountains and deserts are a huge one. You're going to see that in Egypt with the deserts. People aren't going to be attacking them as much because you've got things that are keeping people out. So the Chinese at the time referred to themselves as middle kingdom and rarely traded with outsiders. So not only do you have these borders, you're also having this sense of isolationism. And that word is very key. I would focus on that word because we're going to be talking that word uh, isolationism a lot, particularly when we get to the 1900s. So uh, they kept to themselves for the most part and that also kept them from invaders. So some of their lasting contributions. So their advanced city was pretty much like any other river valley organization. It was pretty well organized um, and it had different walls that would protect them, but not a strong army. Um, unlike other river valley organizations though, the Chinese held peasants a lot higher than artisans or merchants because they would produce food. So rather than having king, merchant, farmer, slaves, it would be more of a king, peasant, merchant, slave. It's a bit more of a switch. So in China, you'd start with your emperor, which uh, if any of you guys have seen Mulan, the emperor is always the leader in China. Uh, then you have your governors and kings who the emperor would appoint over certain areas of this river valley. Then below that, you'd have nobles and scholars, state officials, more of the academia type. Below them, you're gonna have your peasants and people who work the farms. Below that, you get to your artisans, your merchants, your carpenters, your metal workers, uh, below them. Then you have soldiers. So in a lot of these societies, you're going to see soldiers be a lot higher up and seen as these noble people. But in this society, soldiers were pretty much bottom of the totem pole, only just above slaves who were, again, at the bottom. Uh, so in your government in China, uh, it was very similar to Egypt and was ruled by families known as dynasties. So one thing that we're going to be talking about in this class when we're talking about China is these different dynasties. I actually have a really cool song for you guys that I would love if you guys would learn because I think it'll really help you and it's pretty catchy if I'm being honest. Um, so the rulers in this government justify their power by claiming this thing known as the mandate of heaven, which is that they were given approval by the gods to rule over their country. So they're given this mandate of heaven to rule over China. Make sure you guys get this term down. It will definitely be on the test. So then uh, you also have this idea with mandate of heaven. Kings could lose this mandate and be overthrown by a new king called the dynastic cycle. And how, the way this worked is if they were told uh, that the gods disapproved, as they said, uh, they would be overthrown and lose this mandate that gave them the right to rule over the people. China was also ruled by this ethical system known as Confucianism, which focused on filial piety, which is a respect for elders. Uh, and Confucius taught social order. So I kind of like to make this make a comparison with this to Hammurabi's Code. It's this idea of how to live your life how to be a good citizen in China. And that's Confucianism. 
Now we're going to be talking a lot about Confucianism throughout the history of China because it plays a really important role in the philosophy and the lifestyle of the Chinese people. So then we go to religion. So the Chinese believed in ancestor worship. So rather than worship a specific deity or have it or multiple deities, they believe in worshiping and honoring their family ancestors. And again, this is something that still goes on today. If any of you guys have watched Mulan, you remember that part where she goes into the temple and she's praying to her ancestors? That's part of this idea of the Chinese religion. So in writing for China, the Chinese characters stood for sounds, but the 10,000 characters made it hard to learn how to write. So this was a really confusing language, and it still is. If any of y'all are taking Chinese or want to take Chinese, I'm just telling you now, you are in for a time because this is really hard stuff. It's really similar to hieroglyphics, something that it took people a long time to figure out. And even people in China a lot of times still struggle with writing just because it's such a huge, confusing, uh, intense language. So technology. Again, in China, just like in all these other river valleys, they're building different tools, different wealth weapons that are going to help grow their civilization. In China, though, they're also going to have standardized coinage, a way of conversing and exchanging money. And this is a, a thing that we learn in modern society how to do. This idea of having a, a form of paper or a coinage to have your gold or your money backed off of. Uh, and then you also have this thing called the Grand Canal. And this is something that they're going to use to connect North and South China. The other big thing that you guys probably have heard about before is the Great Wall of China. And this wall was built to try to protect China from invasions from the North. Because again, the idea of having this strong, solidified army uh, with the government to back them up wasn't a big thing. And as we saw in the class system here, the army was pretty low on the totem pole. So this Great Wall is going to be seen as a geographical border to protect them from anyone trying to invade. So that's all I've got for you guys. Hope you guys enjoyed this on China.